Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Damian Dankowski. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy in Berlin. It's truly an honor to open this webinar, and I want to thank you all speakers and participants alike for taking the time to be here with us today for this very important conversation. For those who don't know us, um, the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy is a research advocacy and community building organization based in Berlin, Germany, working on bringing an intersectional approach to foreign and security policy worldwide. We do this by conceptually developing um, the, the term um, and the content of feminist foreign policy and concretizing this in our um, other five program areas, um, looking at peace and security, climate justice, anti-racism, human rights and development policy. Um, we see our work as standing on the shoulders of feminist giants and also relying on networks and partnerships. And um, we see ourselves as a policy and advocacy bridge creating spaces for the amplification of the voices of those who know best what needs to be done. Um, and on that note, we have a very packed program today and some excellent speakers. Um, so I will stop here and hand over to my colleague Sarah, who is leading CFFP's work on Afghanistan. Sarah, please go ahead. Thank you, Damian, and also welcome from uh, my side. Um, and thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, my name is Sarah Fatia. I'm a junior project manager at, the, at CFFP. Um, since last year, we work with Afghan women human rights defenders with various expertise. Um, our project and work with the Afghan human rights defenders started after CFF CFFPs previously collaborated on the initiative Defend Afghan Women's Rights. This project is rooted in the need for Afghan women's rights and human rights experts to be able to shape national and international policies on Afghanistan, to be listened to and given legitimacy, ownership of the process and access to policymakers. Um, and we as CFFP work to foster structured dialogue between Afghan women rights defenders and policymakers and basically be a bridge. Um, the project in the last year consisted of four closed door working meetings, advocacy meetings with policymakers and leading to one conference in Berlin in September last year. All our topics were always um, decided by our Afghan uh, steering committee. And um, the whole work basically resulted in the in a final outcome document that some of you already might have read um, of demands that were collected during the last year. Um, Nate Shalimi, our advisor, who kindly accepted to moderate today, will share a bit more about the demands in a bit. Um, maybe to just give you a brief technical information. So in case you have um, questions, you can find below a question box where you can send us your questions. We don't have so much time, unfortunately, in this webinar, but we will try to ask some of the raised questions if possible. Um, our outcome document with the demands on our website, uh, Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, you can find it there. And I will also include the link in the chat. Um, and also this webinar is being recorded. So um, in case you want to watch it later, um, you can also find it on our homepage and YouTube channel. And now um, I would like to introduce our moderator, Nahid Shalini. And handing over to you, Nate John. Thank you very much, Sarah John. From my side, um, um, a, a warm welcome to everybody. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to be here. It is lovely to be here. And um, I welcome um, to this, this truly distinguished panel of experts in Afghanistan, on Afghanistan, um, everybody. Um, and today we come together to launch a policy brief that uh, demands urgent um, action from the international community with recent events in Afghanistan, as you know. Um, it is more crucial than ever to center Afghan women in uh, policy and, uh, and, and, and implementation processes, and to ground our response um, in the international human rights framework, which is highly important. Um, this panel is critical because it provides a platform for experts from various fields to discuss uh, the challenges and opportunities ahead and to chart a way forward uh, towards a more peaceful and equitable future um, to all Af for, our, for all Afghans. Um, it is time for us to listen to the Afghan women, uh, support their economic empowerment and civil society, and to ensure that their rights are protected. Above all, uh, the policy brief uh, provides a roadmap for how we can work together towards this goal. And I look truly forward to hearing insights from our distinguished panelists on how we can turn these demands into action, which is the most important thing. So today, um, it is an honor for me to be here and to moderate this uh, uh, this. Um, this panel, as we are joined by two 
of the seven experts who have been directly involved in crafting a, this policy brief that outlines uh, five demands for a better future in Afghanistan. And these demands were developed over the course of a year, as Sarajan and Damien um, mentioned earlier. Um, and um, over the course of this year, with the, with the involvement of a steering committee uh, that composed of all female Afghan experts from various fields within Afghanistan as well as outside of Afghanistan. So the project was truly owned by the women, um, the Afghan women involved. And um, and again, um, two of them are here. And before I start and, and, and give the mic to our experts, um, I would like to uh, shortly just mention that um, these demands, as we discuss them today, um, were formulated over the course of, a, of an entire year. And it's, it's very essential to acknowledge that the situation in Afghanistan, as well as the international and the Taliban dynamics, um, may change over time, and it will change over time and have changed over time. So as we continue our efforts in suppo uh, to support Afghan women, it's crucial to approach these uh, issues with fluidity and flexibility, adapting our strategies and our responses to the evolving context um, in order to remain effective and relevant in our advocacy and actions. Um, I will read you very shortly the five demands, and then we will go straight to the panelists. Uh, the demand number one is to center Afghan women in national and international policy and implementation processes. Demand number two, ground the international community's response within the international human rights framework. Demand number three, Ensure that humanitarian aid reaches vulnerable groups and that human rights violations are independently documented. Demand number four, provide economic support and assistance, in particular to women entrepreneurs and women-led civil society. And demand number five, last but not least, support people who had to flee Afghanistan. With that said, I would like to go with my first question uh, with Mariam Jan Safi. For those who do not know Mariam Safi, she is a peace practitioner and founding executive director of the Organization for Policy, Research and Development Studies, DROPS. Mariam Jan, it is lovely to have you here, first of all. Uh, great to see you again. Um, the first demand of the the first demand of the policy brief is to center Afghan women in national and international policy and implementation processes. Can you speak to how this demand can be implemented in practice? And um, what are some specific actions that can be taken to ensure that Afghan women are at the forefront of decision-making processes? The mic is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Nigel. And uh, before I begin, I just wanted to wish the organizers, um, our co-panelists, and of course, all of our participants a very happy uh, and blessed month of Ramadan. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, especially those who are 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 holding fast uh, for joining us uh, for today's uh, webinar. Um, as you mentioned earlier, Narjan, this was the first recommendation that we had highlighted, and you know the reason why this was the first. Um, and sometimes it becomes a little bit, you know, some feel that it might be a little bit self-explanatory because the whole idea of the steering committee to begin with was to bring women experts together so they could help inform the decisions that were being made in uh, policymaking circles um, in Europe and beyond. Um, but in the process of this last year and a half, uh, you know, we have noticed, um, and I'm sure you all have at different levels, that that Afghan women's voices is still uh, being treated very rhetorically in some of the discussions that are taking place. Um, and when they are being looked at, it's it's not a it's not a key priority for all nations. Um, other things tend to take priority. Uh, like uh, security, finding a political path forward, how can we engage the Taliban, how can we make do with what we have right now on the ground, um, and that kind of gets encapsulated around this idea um, that policymakers are throwing around for a while now, uh, which is a pragmatic approach. Let's find a pragmatic approach. Now here we are trying to reconcile this pragmatic approach with the concerns and the demands that we have, which is the inclusivity and the representation of women and girls 
also at the same time respect for their human rights and I wish I would say not only women and girls but also of minority groups and other uh, groups that are very vulnerable in Afghanistan that don't get spoken about much. So reconciling these two has become one of the greatest challenges for the women's movement uh, in the last, um, I would say, since the fall of the Republic. And there are very practical ways of engaging Afghan women's voices in decision making. To be very honest with you, it's not very difficult, yet I'm not seeing it happen as much as it should. Um, and those are, for example, well, the first one being, there are several forums like this forum that have been developed around um, Europe um, or in, in North and South America, they've been in Asia. So you've got a lot of these forums that include women from the, from, from the diaspora, those that have uh, lived in the diaspora for a long time and those that were evacuated in August. These forums come together regularly, they're supported, they discuss key issues. We can include these forums into the conversations we're having on um, decisions we're making vis-a-vis -vis, or decisions our capital, capitals are making vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan. And this is quite easy. There's an address for them. There's a contact person. You can link in and, and hear from them directly. The second could be connecting to women inside of Afghanistan. The EEU has a presence uh, within Afghanistan, and a lot of the countries that are involved in Afghanistan, even if they don't have a presence inside of the country, they have presence in Doha, and they have links with constituencies within Afghanistan. Contact UN Women. UN Women has a huge con con constituency uh, with Afghan women across different provinces. Civil so local civil society organizations like Ms. Manisha Wafix, my own, and all of the other Afghan women out there also have institutions, organizations that are still operating, and they're connected connected to women on the ground. So that could be a second approach that could play uh, in this process. But we have to ensure, and I think sometimes the fight is, uh, is not only for including women's voices into this process, but honestly, I think the fight continues to be for ensuring uh, um, gender voices and, and policy making and decision making, broadly speaking. Um, I think countries that even have feminist foreign policies and feminist development policies are always consistently facing difficulties and challenges in trying to have this mainstream within all of the other sectors of their own countries. So sometimes I've, I've, I, in the last two years, I've, I've, I've witnessed this fight where you have one sector of women fighting for this on a broad level to have it included in the decision-making processes of their countries. And then you have another fight happening here simultaneously, which is having Afghan women's voices make sure that they're part and parcel of this initiative. There are two fights happening at the same time here. Let's make, you know, there's no two ways about it. And it's a struggle for both. And they're trying to support one another as they're trying to break this, this, this glass ceiling and trying to get, uh, you know, women, peace and security agenda, uh, a more common and predominant feature in all policy decisions and programming and decision making. So there is that in, in both fronts. And I think what we need to do is try to see it as that as much as we can, try to connect our efforts as much as we can, try to support each other in this fight as much as we can. Because our goal is the same, but you need both of these to move at the same time in order for any one of them to have a great impact when it comes to Afghanistan in particular, to women's situation in Afghanistan. So, so there is a, a much broader conversation also to be had here because it's, it's creating difficulties for the women's movement and what and their objectives and in their fight. Um, and sometimes there are instances where Afghan women have to fight shoulder to shoulder with, with women who are a part of the Women, Peace and Security Initiative in their countries and try to see how much they can move that forward. And then once that's moved forward, then they can bring along the, the, the discussion around including Afghan women's voices in decision making. So uh, I'm sure this is something that that Ambassador O'Neill can talk uh, about. Ms. Newman can can also touch upon a lot. Um, but these were just a few of, of, of my points um, that I wanted to share with you today. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Naijan. 
Thank you, Maria John. It's um, um, earlier I, we we spoke uh, for those that weren't here. Um, I wish we had about a five hours for this panel because it is um, it is so important the information that is coming. We will come back to that point. I will take um, I will take the next question to Manija John this time, and. Um, for, for those who don't know Manija Wafiq, uh, Manija Wafiq is the co-founder and president of the Afghanistan Women Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Manija John, the question to you, and also, by the way, um, one of the members of the steering committee that worked with us uh, for, for the entire year um, tirelessly. Um, Manija John, maybe you can speak about um, about the fourth demand of the policy brief, um, which provides, uh, which is to provide um, economic support and assistance, particularly to women entrepreneurs and women-led uh, civil society. Now, how can this be achieved in a way that um, that it is sustainable and equitable, especially today? And what role can the international actors play in supporting economic development in Afghanistan? Having having heard what Mariam John Safi just said. Um, are there ways to actually do this? Um, the mic is to you, um, Manisha John. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nigeron. And thank you, C50, um, for the um, platform and opportunity for all of us to come back um, and discuss the policy recommendations that um, the Afghan women um, put together. Uh, and Mariam John really um, laid out the ground for that very well and explained how everything worked out. Um, let me first elaborate where we were, John, uh, by August 15, in terms of really um, Afghan women's participation, including um, their economic participation and how everything uh, paused uh, in Afghan women's lives uh, after that. So really, um, uh, if we look at the, some of the numbers, uh, first of all, um, Afghan government was the major employer in Afghanistan. So uh, they had uh, employed uh, around um, 900,000 uh, men and women. Um, and 25% of that, uh, I mean, the total number, 25% of that was women. And after, of course, August uh, 15th, um, all of you uh, know that uh, government employee, go government female employees were banned from their jobs. So that number totally lost their jobs. And so economically as well, they are at this moment uh, disadvantaged uh, and they're not able to earn for, for themselves. Uh, similarly, we have had um, women who were uh, politically active and uh, were in various, um, uh, various uh, decision-making in, in, um, in entities. Uh, for example, uh, parliament. We have had 27% of uh, parliamentarians uh, as women. And after that, of course, we, we have none. And then uh, similarly, um, if we look at the uh, private sector, um, NGOs, CSOs, um, in, in especially in the private sector as well, if we look at some of the major um, service industries, um, all of them have had a great number of uh, women as their employees. Uh, and some of them, for example, were um, banking sector and telecom sector um, in Afghanistan who also have had over 200 to 300,000 employees and 20, 25% of their employees were also uh, women. Uh, we have had over 100 uh, plus um, private um, universities in the country, not only in the major cities, but also in the smaller cities. They also have had employed uh, female, um, female uh, lecturers and, and female employees in their administrations as well. Uh, but um, unfortunately, due to all the restrictions that Taliban imposed, um, women were the first to be laid off uh, after August uh, 15th. And then in the business sector, just to look at uh, women's participation in business, we have had over 57,000, close to 60,000 formal and informal uh, women-owned uh, businesses. And uh, especially if we look at the formal businesses, the 2,471 or uh, close to 2,500 of them, they were um, they were really, uh, half of them were in non-traditional uh, sectors. And by non-traditional sector in Afghanistan, we mean that they were really in um, uh, manufacturing, restaurants, um, travel agencies. Um, they were in uh, media productions. They were in um, IT. Um, and a number of uh, other um, areas 
uh, that were totally, um, totally non-traditional for Afghan women and were very much male dominant. But in the last uh, 20 years, Afghan women had uh, really uh, dared, so to say. They, they, had, they were very brave to enter those um, sectors such as logistics, construction, um, and all of those. And so uh, that half of that formal businesses, the 2,400, uh, in those who were uh, in non-traditional sectors were immediately closed because of the, the fear and because of being so non-traditional uh, logistics, construction, as I said, IT, media, um, private schools and all that. Most of that half uh, were uh, closed in that very early um, when Taliban took over the country. And then all other sectors, if we name it, women in media, women in sports, uh, there were a great number. They were visible. This was very important that women were visible in all those um, sectors. And so that also means if they were, they were there, they were part of those very sectors, they were economically um, getting benefits of, of uh, their participation, right? And so unfortunately now, they are, they are unbenefited, they are disadvantaged because of the, the current regimes, um, current regimes um, restrictions and bans on, on women. And um, one of the hope, at least until December 2022, was uh, women's CSOs and NGOs um, in their work in this CSO and NGO sector. But unfortunately, that also with the edict the Taliban uh, released on December 24, 2022. Um, that, that hope also was uh, taken from our women. Uh, women were banned from jobs and NGOs and CSOs. And so um, that means that women CSOs, women-led CSOs and women-focused CSOs are facing now trifolded uh, challenges comparing um, to what they were facing um, early on when the Taliban took over. Uh, and the extent is to the level that, for example, um, we've been talking to uh, women CSOs in the last, um, in the last few months, that um, their bank accounts are uh, being controlled. When women they go to, um, to go, uh, when they go to the bank to withdraw, they, the banks show them, the private banks, they show them a letter from the Ministry of um, Economy and from the um, uh, authorities, the current authorities, that those women uh, are asked to be replaced by a male uh, NGO member. Uh, to handle even the the bank account because even they don't want a woman to uh, go to the to banks for example so you can you can see the extent of um, how women have been disadvantaged economically in the last um, 18 19 months and so um, what are some of the ways that all of us could put hands together to really um, help uh, the situation and help our uh, women first of all for women businesses um, we definitely need to continue um, giving them um, grants, uh, giving them training programs um, in whatever way it's possible. In person, yes, because women, uh, women's businesses were not banned. Women's uh, traditional businesses have continued. Um, and by traditional, I mean women, um, women um, in handicraft in uh, processing uh, food in very traditional manner and producing jams, pickles and um, spices for the, for the um, local use. Um, so at least that those businesses that have continued, uh, we can continue also um, uh, providing them uh, training programs and providing them grants so they could cover their uh, costs and could, could at least remain alive, if not, much in terms of um, expansion or in terms of uh, growing their businesses because of the general economy that Afghanistan is going uh, going through that um, economic uh, crisis. Manisha John, I'm gonna um, um, thank you so much for this. Can you can you hold that thought? I, I know that I'm cutting you off here because Hannah Neumann has to leave in five minutes, and okay. I would I would I'm gonna come back to you because this is the person that has to basically tell you how all of those those things that you just said how it would be done. 
So before I hand in the mic to uh, to um, Hannah Neumann, for those who do not know Hannah Neumann, um, she's a member she's a member of the pa European Parliament uh, from the Green Party, vice chair of the EP subcommittee on human rights as well as many other lists. And I'm not going to, I'm going to cut that short because I know she has to leave. And I thank you so much for the time. So please tell us how can, um, can that be provided to the on, the, on the ground in Afghanistan, but at the same time, if you can, um, maybe uh, you can provide a brief overview of the EU's efforts to support Afghanistan and Afghan women and how, and the highlight of your work, especially, uh, which prioritizes these rights and, and the challenges that you face and any, any ask, uh, specific inputs that you, um, that you have in, in, the, in your future uh, initiatives. The mic is yours, Hannah. I thank you so much and I'm I'm very honored to be amongst all of you and I will listen until the end but I have to go into the plenary and vote so the speaking part would be difficult um so on on your questions and and the, you actually sent over one question before the workshop that I liked a lot which was in what way is your work mainstreaming and prioritizing Afghan women's rights because one thing is you having these very important and crucial and timely policy demands. But the other question is, well, how responsive is basically the international community side, and I can mainly speak for the European Union, to all of that. And for me, the moment when we had this infamous Taliban press conference on August 15, after they took over power, where they said, well, women can continue to do everything, but they do not have a role in politics. That was for me the moment that triggered already a lot of alarms because that is where the decisions are being made. And for me, initially the question was, okay, they can come up with a rule, but what is our response to it? And since then I kind of developed four ground rules for dealing and working on Afghanistan that I continue to raise in the European context. And I kind of force on myself, but I'm also trying to force them on whoever makes well uh, business with and on Afghanistan. The first one being there's no discussion on Afghanistan without raising women's and minority rights. And you think it sounds cumbersome, but it's still happening. I just had an AFID committee, like a foreign affairs committee meeting recently. I was still like, how can you discuss the challenges of Afghanistan and not mentioning women and gender? So it's still happening. So ground rule number one, no discussion without talking about women and minority rights. Ground rule number two, no missions to Afghanistan without having women in your own team and meeting women and not meeting women as we meet male leader A, male leader B, male leader C, and then we meet the women, but we meet women expert on economies, we meet women expert on defense and so on. So really making the point that they have to be taken into account for missions. And if it's security wise, difficult when going to Afghanistan, do digital meetings in advance, but there is no excuse. Rule number three, no decision on Afghanistan without consulting, well, Afghan women. And that is where you come. Doesn't mean that we just go with their rules. Then we have to open another table at worst, which is, I think, part of the work you do and others do. And we have the Afghan Women Leadership Network, for example, on the EU level as a response. And rule number four, everyone should use the little power we have to give a platform to Afghan women um, to speak. So wherever I can, I'm trying to make sure that I'm not just talking about Afghan women, but Afghan women can speak very well for themselves. What challenges do I experience with these four ground rules? Um, because that was your second question, Nahid. I think there, are, there is a lot of willingness in theory to do all of that, but then the patriarchal reflexes killing, <laughs> kick in. Like seriously, the first one is still talking about Afghan women, which even if it's well-intentioned, continues to objectify these women. The second one being treating them as an aggregate, as I said. So we met with leader ABC and then we meet Afghan women. I mean, imagine you saying, okay, we talk about Afghanistan today. So I spoke to Chucky O'Neill, Shahina Gambir, Nahid Shalimi, and then a group of men. You would think it's odd. Why is it not all the other way around? And we really have to make people reflect because often it's not bad intention, it's just the old reflexes kicking in. Or 
let's solve the real issues first, like how can we revive the economy and then talk about the women. And this, it has to come up front and just the examples we heard is we can only fix the economy if we have women included in all of that. Um, yes, and then making sure that in the key functions we continue to put in women because for some weird reason, they are sidelined. So for me, the key is how can we make sure that at least in the work that we do as the international community, we give women the space and the room to be actors in their own destiny and not objectify them. And this is why a group of Afghan women that comes forward with a policy paper such as this is pure growth. Thank you so much, uh, liebe Hanna. Um, I know you have to leave, um, but if you do, if you can uh, come and, and speak, please lift your finger up so that we know and and, and bring you in. Uh, thank you so much. And Manisha John, um, I will I will come back. Um, um, if if you would like to continue, you can continue, or we can come back at the end and and maybe um, hear the rest of the panelists. Just quickly, uh, Go, John, I know I overspoke, but uh, just give me one second to. To, to talk about this one more recommendation. Um, so for women's businesses, I said, uh, we definitely need to continue giving them grants and supporting them uh, with training programs digitally or in whatever way possible. And as well as one of the other way for Af as all of us would be to connect Afghan women, Afghan women's businesses um, to digital economy, really supporting their um, marketing and sales via um, digital means. And so for that, we have also developed uh, recently, we have developed um, online sales portal called madebyafghanwomen.com and that's uh, something that everyone can uh, support and continue supporting because the vision for that is to become uh, an Amazon of Afghan women's uh, products um, and only Afghan women vendors would be allowed to sell via that uh, platform. And um, the last for women CSOs I would like to emphasize on would be continuing um, funding their operate, operating cost, uh, their core um, funding um, manner as much as possible without requiring them to uh, really um, register. Uh, register in terms of like um, registering their projects with the Minister of Economy or being under any of those kind of uh, pressures and finding other ways uh, than transferring uh, their funding through Afghanistan banks. So that, that would be the last thing that I would like to emphasize. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Majid John. Again, I would like to remind everybody that whenever, if you want to see these policy demands, please go on the CFFP um, official website and read about them in detail. And uh, it is it is a it is a brief document and very um, very important uh, for uh, for all to read. Uh, thank you so much. Um, um, and now I go to um, Her Excellency Ambassador Jack Jacqueline O'Neill, um, a fellow Canadian, which I am very glad to have here. Um, um, Ms. O'Neill, or Ambassador O'Neill, is the Ambassador for Women, Peace and Security for Canada. Um, the, the ball is in, in your Good court. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. How, how, uh, what would you like to add to everything that you have heard so far, first and foremost? But at the same time, um, if you can, um, if you can tell us briefly what Canada is doing to support Afghanistan and and the women of Afghanistan, and then we take it from there. The mic is yours. Yeah. Thanks so much, Nahid. Uh, I remember very well when. Uh, us two Canadians met for a coffee in a coffee shop in Ottawa some time ago, and you told me about this very process uh, and shared your wonderful book. And we talked about the, the need for something exactly like this. So I'm really glad to be able to be here today. And uh, bonjour to everyone from Canada and to colleagues who I know are in Canada uh, and to all of uh, today's other speakers and, and Sarah and Damien and, and the team at CFFP, thank you so much for organizing this. And my dear friend, Miriam and Manjina, whose work I've read for a long time. I wish you all didn't have to be doing this work, uh, but as you are, I feel very lucky to be with you today for the launch of this and to talk, as you were just saying, Nahid, about um, the demands and what Canada is doing and can do to help implement them and also to help disseminate them and, and really to help make sure that we keep 
Afghanistan very squarely in the minds of our leaders and our populations and, and even amidst this continuous stream of developments that are just so devastating and are called uh, by many people, including uh, Zara Nader on this call, who has uh, directly said to the Security Council, this is gender apartheid. Uh, we are often as Canada, you know, and very rightly asked, what does it mean for Afghan women that Canada has a feminist foreign policy? And, and I wanna highlight just a few things that relate very much to the demands that are shared today. Uh, first thing I'll say is that Feminist foreign policies and feminist approaches have to apply everywhere. And there seems sometimes there are discussion about even in Afghanistan today and even in this context. And there just is nowhere that is simply too challenging to apply feminist principles and approaches. And in fact, it's often where it's needed most. And we simply cannot and will not accept uh, any argument that it is you know, simply a cultural difference that, uh, or any, anything along those lines about this is something just a, a different way. Um, secondly, it needs that it means that we don't need to make the case internally every time that there's a crisis that there are gender dimensions to everything. And to the points we were just talking about, we know that every decision related to public and private life affects Afghan men and women differently, and it has to therefore be shaped by men and by women. And then thirdly, to your last point and your very first recommendation, it means we also have to center the voices of Afghan women themselves. Uh, we have to make sure that Afghan women's expertise and recommendations and perspectives are placed at the center of our policies. And the, the, the preamble of the prior, the demands, I uh, couldn't say it better, it says only when all foreign policies are informed by the impacted communities grounded in an intersectional understanding of human rights for all. Will they contribute to a more just, equitable, and peaceful world? And Maria mentioned, you know, at the beginning in her remarks that sometimes there's a perception and there is a, a reality that quote unquote other things take to tend to take priority over women's inclusion, things like security and the economy, et cetera. But the real fundamental challenge I think that we all face in this misunderstanding is that they are somehow separate or they can be separated or that they're different or that women's meaningful inclusion in every element isn't core to our discussions about security and the economy and everything else. And so I, I completely understand the need to make that demand number one. Um, I've worked a lot with coalitions of women in um, past life and past jobs. And I know sometimes how difficult it is to come to consensus on these issues. And uh, to the point, uh, you know, we just heard Afghan women aren't homogenous uh, and that's okay. And so sometimes people say, well, Afghan women themselves don't agree on X or Y. Who cares? <laughs> Afghan men don't agree on X or Y and men everywhere don't agree on X or Y. And sometimes they fight wars over that. So it doesn't matter if there's dispute in a coalition, that's just normal. Um, I, I'll wrap up here. I just say that the demands were excellent for, for many reasons. Um, one, we're very, sorry, there's a garbage truck outside my house. Um, one of the reasons is that many of us in the international community have to be and want to be really conscious of not asking the same question over and over to the same people. So what you're doing is helping us in key ways to coordinate ourselves, which we need to keep doing. Uh, and then we also, I really appreciate how much uh, you've given in the in the demands, which I think is very helpful, demands that are both broad uh, and relate to overarching policy and overarching international responses, and then demands that relate very much to things that we have control over ourselves, such as who we send in delegations to meeting, many of the things that Hannah was just describing. So I will leave it there. I know I'm also over time uh, and so that we can hear from more people, but I really wanna thank you for putting these in such a, um, a manageable way. As you said, Miriam, it's not, it's not exceptionally hard, but things that make it easier are very welcome. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador O'Neill. It's been, um, um, and, and I'm sure that there will be lots of other questions that are gonna come after this, but thank you so much for, for taking the time and um, for being here. Truly, the support means the world. Um, I will take the mic uh, to um, uh, to another lovely um, um, person that I have had the um, the great pleasure of meeting through 
uh, the work for Afghanistan. And um, this is uh, Ms. Shahina Gambir, who is the spokesperson uh, of the Inquiry Commission, Lessons from uh, Afghanistan for Future, Lessons uh, for Afghanistan uh, for Future German Engagement. She's also a member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, um, Alliance of Nine, uh, 90, the, the Greens Parliamentary Group, and in uh, German Bundestag, the Parliament. And um, Ms. Shahina, who I've had the pleasure of meeting and having a few uh, chats with, um, um, I would I would like to I would like to know that as a member of the German Inquiry Board for Afghanistan, can you briefly maybe explain the work of the Inquiry Board and um, where it is standing at the moment, for example, and what are what are for example what are your assessments of the situation in Afghanistan? How can the international community, for example, learn from the mistakes made in the past two decades? And and we'll take it from there. The mic is yours, uh, Libya Shahina. Thank you so much, Nahitan. I'm um, very happy to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I will start with the Enquete Commission, um, the Enquete Commission called Lessons uh, from Afghanistan is um, looking into Germany's 20 years involvement um, in Afghanistan. We were active there for 20 years in terms of a foreign security and development policy and promised a lot. Unfortunately, uh, we have uh, kept uh, just a few um, promises. We need um, to come to the terms, how could this happen? So first and foremost, uh, because we owe it to the Afghan people, we owe it so much, but we also owe it to the um, practices um, we sent there on the mission, for example, all the diplomats, the soldiers, the civil society employees. Um, the Commission of Inquiry has been set up for two years. This is um, not a lot of time um, for a 20-year period. In the first year, we will look back. So, um, And in the second year, we will draw um, lessons from the findings of uh, our first-year analysis. We plan um, to have an interim report after this first year and uh, it will probably come in the end of the year and it will all be, um, also be a final report after the second year, which will be after the summer break in 2024. So in other words, um, we will uh, first deal with uh, com uh, to coming to the terms with our mistakes. After that, we want to learn um, lessons for the future. And um, we want to make sure that we don't repeat all the mistakes um, what we have made. Um, so um, the Enquete Commission will look back, but we also look forward. Um, what is important to me um, in our work, that we must be open-minded and self-critical. There must be no taboo subjects. Mistakes um, that we have made must be clearly stated and openly discussed. There must be um, they must not be um, repeated in the future, but we don't just look at the mistakes, honestly. We must identify things that have gone well and strengthen them in the future. And the situation today is um, more than um, a year and a half um, after the Taliban took power in Afghanistan. We see the clock, is, like uh, you all said, uh, in Afghanistan seem not to be only standing still, still, but they're going backwards. Women and girls are being made invisible and they are being... Um, um, out of the right of education, participation, the hopes of equality and security have not been released. And um, the de facto rulers are not fulfilling their responsibilities. They are unbanding the population. Um, the humanitarian situation is catastrophic and there is no effort on the part of the Taliban that will improve. So I don't want to uh, prejudge the work of the Enquete Commission. As I said, we will publish the first results in the end of the year. But I can say um, this, that 20 years ago, we went to Afghanistan exclusively out of the island's um, solidarity. It was not about the country and it was not about the people. And now we have left. And um, so our future efforts should now be about precisely two things, um, the country and the people. And uh, they must um, always be the focus of our decisions from now on. So like you all, all said also on the woman, on the, on, 
on the children, on the minorities. And um, because of the dynamics in 2001, we went into Af Afghanistan without any knowledge. Political decisions were made without any knowledge of the diverse culture, uh, the various line of conflicts about the history of the country. This too uh, must not be repeated. We must stay informed and um, constantly educated ourselves both on history and the current situation. So we need a network of locals, scholars and um, civil society workers to get an authentic picture of the situation. That's um, very important um, that we ha hear all of the groups. And um, um, one thing um, we have um, we known, um, in fact, is during the engagement um, in Afghanistan, there was a fatigue um, set in Afghanistan felt in um, in the out of the public interest, and this not must happen again. Um, Afghanistan must remain on the political agenda, and um, I think that's um, very important. I will um, uh, wrap up now because um, I think um, that we also need uh, some room for the questions. Uh, thank you, Shahina John. Yes, there are some questions that have been already uh, sent in, uh, and we also collected some some questions before the panel for, uh, via social media. So we have some really good good questions. And authentic is something that that sticks to my mind. And uh, and I'll I'll maybe just maybe briefly I'll ask. Um, speaking of the authentic um, um, responses to uh, to the to the mistakes that were made in the last twenty years, maybe you can you can tell uh, this this panel and the audience, do we have authentic voices of Afghans when it comes to the enquête, to the inquiry? Are there enough Afghans involved in this inquiry in order to get that authentic voice? No. In my opinion, if uh, I can speak openly, in my view, then there's uh, a need of more Afghan people uh, in this commission. Um, I am al always fighting for that. And um, I think it's very important that we have this view in this enquete uh, commission, that we have a lot of views because it was a very a big uh, engagement on, on uh, different levels. So if it comes to Afghan people, um, there have to be Afghan people talking for themselves. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Shahina Jan. I'm, um... I have my own 50 questions that are already here, but I'll pass the mic, the mic further and I'm sure we have other questions that are gonna come. Um, and I will take the mic to um, uh, Ms. Uh, Sahar uh, Fitrat. Sahar John is a researcher with the uh, Women's Rights Division at Human Rights Watch. And she is a feminist activist and an incredible producer. For those who don't know her, please go and find her work uh, online on Twitter and, and just, cheer this rock star. Um, it is lovely to have you here, um, Sarjan. And um, there are very many questions that have come to both you and our next wonderful uh, speaker um, because you come from the media. So um, please tell us, what are the expectations towards the countries with feminist foreign policies that, for example, that, that, that you would have? And how can these countries better support the demands of the Afghan people um, and women? And also the role of the media in all of this and how you collect your, um, um, you know, your information. Maybe you can tell us about that first and then go into, um, into these questions or make a compilation of what you've heard so far. Your, uh, your, the mic is yours. Thank you so much. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, and I'm actually working with Human Rights Watch. So most of our work is on uh, research and advocacy, uh, but um, I, I am a documentary filmmaker as well, an activist at heart and at work. Uh, so I will share uh, my knowledge and things that I have heard. Uh, I'll try to respond to the question by uh, reflecting on uh, movements. And I'm, I'm the kind of person who's always amazed and inspired by movements. And uh, since the Taliban uh, took over Afghanistan, we all know that um, women-led movements and grassroots women-led movements um, have been the most visible and vocal civic opposition to the Taliban to this day. Um, and uh, we see many uh, women and uh, female protesters who uh, advocate and also risk their lives on a daily basis for a better future, not only for women, but all people of Afghanistan. And 
Uh, to add to that, um, um, we know that uh, some people uh, had to leave uh, Afghanistan when the Taliban uh, took over, and um, some were uprooted, never had, uh, had a chance to go back or say goodbye, and all of those are painful. But what we know is that a lot of people remained, and they had no other opportunity to leave the country. So we know that time is not linear, the reality is not re uh, linear, and our narrative of reality are not re um, um, linear. So new realities and new movements emerge every day. And I hope we have the eyes to see them and to recognize them and to believe them. Uh, and so with that, I want to say that we need to uh, acknowledge the emerging and establish, uh, and establish grassroots uh, women-led movements and network inside the country uh, and outside. Um, with working at Human Rights Watch, working with other partner organizations, we have had an opportunity to uh, talk to and consult with different groups emerging in Afghanistan um, um, since the takeover of the Taliban. And uh, they have shared different narratives. They've shared their own narratives. They share the, the fact that they cannot register as a CSO or um, uh, as um, uh, an NGO. However, um, they practice agency and they aim to change the situation and they face the challenges. And they have asked us that they are tired of the narrative that Afghan women are uh, helpless victims. And so uh, our shared understanding is that we need to shift the question and ch change it towards those who actually victimize Afghan women, not those who are victim uh, victimized uh, or the victims or survivors. So uh, with these um, consultations that we have had, um, uh, there were a number of issues they have shared with us, uh, acknowledging that, uh, demanding that the world knows and, and names them as, um, as a group or groups of women uh, and activists who actually uh, um, uh, keep alive the discourse of human rights inside the country. And so the, the, uh, some of the many points they have shared, and these could be recommendations for feminist foreign policy countries, is to first and foremost acknowledge uh, uh, Afghan women's agency and their struggles and their expertise and their talent and knowledge and work. And um, there is no way we think from outside that we know better than them. We, there is no way that we think we are the only ones who can uh, uh, assess the risk. They know how to bargain with the situation. They know how to work around. And that acknowledgement from both Afghans and uh, governments and organizations is quite important. And second, they shared that they wanted to be invited uh, and get platforms and both uh, um, um, international platforms to share their knowledge and expertise and ex uh, struggles and directly uh, to, uh, represent themselves to governments when they're making recommendations. With regards to funding and technical support, our colleagues already shared that, but uh, they need um, a small amounts of support to be able to operate. And this doesn't have to be crazy amount of money with the, the uh, governments to, uh, need to uh, be accountable and see how, monitor how it's done. But that support for civil society is quite important. They want recognition and visibility as uh, WHRDs of Afghanistan or civil society of Afghanistan. The more we name them, the more uh, it will benefit us and uh, and uh, the movements uh, in, inside the country. The other demand is um, finding opportunities to for network building and connecting them with feminists and WHRD uh, around the world to share knowledge and ex expertise. Um, some of the challenges that they've shared is uh, the fact that their, their movements are being sabotaged their uh, agency uh, and knowledge uh, and expertise is being undermined. There are selective activism and a monolithic understanding of who Afghan woman is. So another recommendation with, regard, with regards to this is that to consult various groups of Afghan women, uh, to consult uh, different age, different, you know, our approach should be very intersectional, engaging with them. And with that, uh, I'll just add one more point that, um, movements inspire one another and that we see as breadwork freedom in Afghanistan is no longer in Afghanistan but we see woman life freedom in Iran is no longer limited to Iran we we have seen in in as neighboring countries they have uh, shared these demands uh, and uh, they keep inspiring one another 
And what we can do is to acknowledge them, name them, and to uh, try to work with them, but let not sab sabotage their movements and let them show us what how bravery works and how um, and what their demands are. So with that, I'm going to close. Um, uh, love to hear from Zahra because she has more knowledge as a journalist. Um, thank you, Sarjan. Um, um, it's always lovely hearing you speak. Um, before I move forward, I would like to ask uh, all the panelists and the audience if it's okay whether we can go a little bit um, more than than let's say in, in four minutes. Otherwise, uh, another ten minutes or fifteen minutes. Does every is everybody okay with that? Unfortunately, I have to go also to the parliament to vote okay. later. So I will just um, like Hannah. Um, we we'll go and hear you. How how long do you have, Shahina John? After like four, like like okay. four more minutes. <laughs> Three minutes. So okay. I've, I've planned it uh, very well, so I'm so sorry. Okay. No, 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 no. It's it's so it's, sorry. it's, uh, it's I, like I said, we need five hours for this this kind of a panel. But it would be lovely to if you can if you can keep in keep yes, on hearing. Of it, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. I will take um, you with me. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, the mic goes to um, Zahra Jan. Um, uh, Zahra Jan is a wonderful, um, wonderful person who um, who is an Afghan Canadian journalist and the editor in chief of Zan Times. Zan means women in Dari, a media that covers um, human rights violations in Afghanistan with a focus on women, LGBTQI plus community and environmental issues. It is lovely and an honor to have you here, Zahra Jan. And I, will, um, I would like to know how we can engage in more meaningful discussions about Afghanistan and um, what role can the media play in promoting women's rights and amplifying Afghan women's voices? I know that this is a question that comes very often and it feels like a cut and paste question. However, that is the most simple question that we, like that is the basic question that we have. And additionally, it would be great if you can maybe um, give your insights on what actions can the international community from your perspective and from the perspective of a journalist that has all of this information and, and these fluidity fluidity information that we talked about earlier and um and how how that support can be uh, you know from from the afghan media outlets and to, to ensure that that the safety of the journalists for example which is very important and media workers in the country are safeguarded so i will give you the mic and um uh, yes Thank you so much, Naijan. I just want to thank the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy for organizing this panel and all the panelists. I'm very much happy that we have a few international actors here, which definitely our perspective would be, you know, a good place so they can take it to where it needs to be. Um, so I am a very talkative person, so I just very feel stressed now that I don't have, uh, you know, a lot of time, but I will try to wrap up uh, the, what's um, I think is most important to be raised. And I think when I was reading these recommendations, I was thinking about why it's important for international community to focus on Afghan women's demand. What, like we know, like this now almost close to getting two years that the Taliban take over Afghanistan. And Afghanistan is the only country on the planet that denies women the basic human rights to live as a human. What Afghan women are doing, they are on the forefront of fighting for humanity, fighting for human rights. And that should be seen as that, not Afghan women as a victim. And what they are asking for international, what they are asking the international community is not seeing them as a pity, is not pitying them and saying, oh, like you are that miserable and we should be there and help you and support you. No, they want accountability. They want to know what happened, why Afghan women are here today. And that should be the way we look at this and not as a, something that we demand the international community to engage in Afghanistan or to start another war, rather than be accountable tell us what went wrong why afghan women voices were not included why we were not why afghan women were never heard even in the past 20 years and why we are here why after 20 years of investment why are we here do we have the right to ask that question i think we do and afghan women are asking every day they come to the streets they empty handed facing the taliban who are not only the enemy of afghan women who are the enemy in, in, in a larger, you know, in a larger scale, I just want to be very much frank about what we are facing. Well, Taliban is not only the problem of Afghanistan. We are facing a larger problem and the world is facing a larger problem with the Taliban. 
And um, I really want the, you know, like the change of narrative. Like, how do we discuss about Afghan women? It should not be about, hey, countries, hey, international community, please come and help the poor Afghan woman. It should be said for your own sake, not for the sake of Afghan women. Come and pay attention now if you don't want to see another 9-11 happening two years, five years down the road. And we already have seen the example of that. al the leader being in Kabul, just, you know, uh, months after Taliban taking over, that is a dangerous sign, and the world should pay attention to that sign, to the sign that is continuously coming out of Afghanistan now, if they want to prevent what's going to happen in the future, what's going to happen in two, in two three years. Um, uh, early on, when I was talking, you know, interviewing um, Afghan women um, who are protesting in Kabul, one of them, I'm going to quote her, her name is Rishmin Juyanda, she told me that tell the world that Taliban is like a pandemic. They cannot be contained in the borders of Afghanistan. If you want to ensure that they don't get to you, that they don't get to your society, you better act now. And you don't need to be acting for the sake of Afghan women, because we know that if you are going to act for the sake of Afghan women, we were not here today. We were not experiencing what's happening in Afghanistan. We know what is our situation, and we know how the world treats us. Um, they didn't listen to us uh, when we were calling on them that the, any deal with the Taliban is a war on Afghan women, is a war on their rights. Nobody listened to them, but they said for their own sake, they have to be, li they have to be listening what is happening because that have consequences from each of, for each of these countries involved in Afghanistan. And that's what they should pay attention because we know they will not be, you know, so much um, interested to pay attention to Afghan women and their voices. So I think we need a change of narrative and also why uh, media is important because media can play, uh, can portray in how we talk about this crisis. It shouldn't not be about, hey, you know, like this is what's happening, you know, like here and there. We are seeing that men and women of Afghanistan are suffering. Um, we know the activist uh, Matteo Loviso was arrested only because he was asking for girls' right to education. It's a bigger problem, and it should be looked at that, you know, at the scale that uh, international media and also Afghan media have a responsibility to raise an alarm and to really much show what is taking place and why the role of media and especially the role of women journalists is very much important in this context is because without Afghan women voices, without women journalists being on the ground, we don't have a picture of what's exactly taking place in the house. Even before the Taliban take over, 95% of violence against women were happening inside the house. And then how is the situation now? Do we have a picture of that? I guess not, because now women have no venue, no way to seek help, no way that they can, you know, run away and find a place to seek safety. They have no choice, and we are seeing lots of cases of suicide in Afghanistan. And why that cases are going up is because they don't see a future. They don't see any hope, and they don't see any way to help themselves. They would rather die and live in this situation. And that's what we are seeing in Afghanistan. And I really hope that this policy, that this, um, I really much appreciate that uh, Center for uh, Feminist Foreign Policy put all this together because now it should go and it should really have powerful voices that, hey, if you want to change situation, it should start with listening to Afghan women, listening to women who are fighting the Taliban now in Kabul and they are taking the risk and they are being killed for asking their rights. Their voice should be heard. Otherwise, I think um, it's not only Afghan women who will be losing uh, if the Taliban stay in power and should be that should be clearly com communicated with them. Otherwise, asking please come and help Afghan women is not going to change anything. So I'm going to stop there because I see already I went over my time. So if we can stay longer and discuss, I would be happy to, to share more. Thank you so much, Zahra John, for this, uh, for the wonderful um, um, inputs. There is one question that um, I don't know whether we're going to be able to um, ask any any questions from. There are some wonderful questions that have come in. However, there was one question from um, from Instagram to um, to you, and maybe if Zahra John wants to chime in afterwards, uh, do you feel social media activism spaces have done their part in spotlighting Afghanistan? If not, what do you wish social media activism had done differently? 
Thank you very much for that question. Um, most of the time, I'm not so much active on social media because I see people post something, they write something, and they feel confident that they have done their parts in fight against patriarchy, in fight against for women's rights in Afghanistan. No, unfortunately, you know, I know the Taliban is also very powerful in social media. They use it to propagate their views. And the way I see it, it's good to share knowledge. It's good to say, hey, this is happening and keep sharing the knowledge and bringing and talking about what is happening in Afghanistan for women. But it's more important to engage in real life action. And that requires you, wherever you are, to think of real ways outside social media as well. And that would be, for example, if you're living in one of these countries that were involved in Afghanistan in the past 20 years, you have, a, you know, you should take your country responsible because we, the women in Afghanistan, they do not have any means and they do not, they have little means to take these countries accountable. But you, as a citizens of this country, have a right to really go to your um, representative and question them, like, why we were 20 years in Afghanistan with this claim that we are going to liberate Afghan women, but at the end, they are living even worse than what they were in 2021. Uh, why is this? And why not many knowledge? Why why you're not talking critically? And why it just, you know, you are just... Um, I know some of the country are um, um, putting fund into humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, but that is not enough. That is the easiest thing that they can do because before they were also sending money to Afghanistan and paying the cost. Of it. So they feel uh, okay. They feel that they have done their job because they are um, funding Afghanistan humanitarian crisis. Still, there's a big question there because when I talk to the people in Afghanistan, the one that is most needed this help, they are not getting it. And I'm very worried that there, is there any accountability mechanism there that show us clearly that this money is not going in Afghanistan and funding the gender apartheid that the Taliban are building. So this question should be asked. I know it's very hard. It's it's always hard to be critical. It's always hard to question things, but I think that's, that's where we start. That is where we should start. If we are going to have a conversation which would be constructive, which would help us to, which would lead to real action. Um, I know it's, again, time is very constrained, so I want to give Sahar time to speak as well. That's good. Um, that's it. Thank you so much, uh, Zahra John. Sahar John, um, quickly, uh, an in, an, a chime in for this question. Yes, I, I believe, um, I agree with everything Zahra said. I just want to add that uh, social media is a, uh, is a possibility. And it's, you know, at this time where we don't have access to our country, where... Uh, um, you know, we can't do much actually. Um, as you know, there are different kinds of activism. So maybe some days sharing um, um, the news and uh, informing the world is is the most that we can do. So, and I understand that the younger generation of Afghanistan are using TikTok, and you know, there is a way of like connecting and understanding where people are, what they think, and also reconnecting in creative ways. But because whether we want it or not, people who are harmful are already taking over. They are doing their uh, activism. They are doing their knowledge sharing, um, their own way of um, uh, you know communicating with people. So I believe it's it's important for us to do our part as well. And uh, this is to inform our allies, but also work with our people and uh, connect with them because a lot of work we do is actually because we don't uh, human rights watch doesn't have a um, presence in Afghanistan and uh, we do use our uh, the networks that we have built the trust that we have built the use of um, um, social media the use of all these internet possibilities that the internet has provided us to uh, to communicate both way so we can see it as a possibility and I think um, we can do more. All citizens can do, uh, all of us can uh, inform other people of what's happening in Afghanistan at least. Thank you, Sahar John. And uh, with that, I would like to give a last um, commentary and or input from um, from from the rest of the panelists um, and um, Ambassador O'Neill, perhaps as very briefly, how do you see it for the future? When it comes, um, I mean, it's a very, it's a million dollar question, but it is a question that is, uh, that I think as a, as a, as a, as a WPS ambassador and also as a, as a FFP country, uh, but at the same time, as a woman, how do you see the future of all of this in, 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 in terms of implementation part? 
I mean, we have an ability to influence the future, right? And that's all I can, the only way I can think about it is that we have to create the future that we want. And I think we're going to do it only through centering Afghan women. And that's, you know, if, if I were, if we step back from the effort to make that happen, then I see a very uh, concerning and troubling future. I also see a future that's not going to be easy to make this happen. We have you know, just speaking about online and social media, we have a lot of resistance to this, a lot of people finding, uh, seeing this as an opportunity for them to seize back power. Uh, and we just have to, we have to be as determined and which is silly for, for me to say sitting in my comfortable home in Ottawa, but, you know, we, we need to support Afghan women to continue to be as resilient and determined as possible. And, and I think all I can say from, from Canada and for me personally as a woman is that this is not um, this is not only because it might come to Canada, but this is something that is just a, a grave, grave violation of humanity. And we have to we have to fight against it in every possible way. So we will create a future that will be different from the one if we step back. Thank you so much, Ambassador O'Neill. Um, one last word, uh, Manisha John and Mariam John, if you're still um, on your mics, um, that would be lovely to, to just before I wrap it up. You can start if you want, Manisha John, and then Mariam John will go. Thank you, uh, Nai John. Um, I think um, there was a question, so I would like to uh, maybe answer that question, and that would be a uh, wrap up. Um, a question uh, by the audience was that uh, whether the independent uh, assessment uh, that was um, that was uh, approved uh, at the UN Security Council, uh, whether that will help or not. Um, I think the discussion uh, the last few weeks was that yes, it will help, hopefully, uh, especially because the members of that uh, independent assessment um, team, uh, would be assigned by the um, uh, General Secretary of the UN, and they would directly report to the General Secretary as well. Um, and uh, the efforts that Afghan women are making at this moment together with UN women is that the team is comprised of um, a good number of um, men and women with different expertise, uh, including gender expertise and feminist um, expertise as well. So, so uh, they could really look into the issues of Afghanistan with that that lens of gender and, and women and feminist um, uh, lens. Um, so if we um, if we hopefully have a good team that the general secretary would um, assign, uh, there there can be a good report, and that report can be also used for um, as we were told for uh, further. Um, practical actions. Um, and the other question was on the um, real representatives of Afghan women. I would like to uh, say that every woman, every Afghan woman who speaks uh, on the common issues that Afghan women are uh, facing in that country are the true representatives of themselves and Afghan uh, women. And it's unfortunately that divide that uh, some people have started to really pushing on Afghan women, such as saying that women in diaspora or women in, inside Afghanistan, uh, because women even who are outside Afghanistan and considered as, as women diaspora or women in, um, um, uh, in uh, so to say, uh, at this moment, um, uh, women uh, in exile, uh, they, they speak with women inside of Afghanistan and then speak about them and about their issues. So for me personally, every woman of Afghanistan are true representatives of every other Afghan woman because they speak about common issues of Afghan women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manisha John. Uh, Maria John, you got the mic. Uh, thanks, Nai John. Um, you know, to go back to the, the question um, by Ms. Nasruddin, on the independent assessment. If this is the independent assessment you are referring to that the EU proposed um, at the United Nations, um, if it's that assessment that you're referring to, um, that assessment came out of uh, sort of 
it kind of came out of left field. We weren't expecting it. And we were really very concerned when it did because the United Nations does its, the UNAMA does its own internal assessment. So we didn't know what was the need for another one. And then on top of that, it wasn't quite clear as to what, what this assessment would ultimately mean or how it would impact the current situation of women and girls in Afghanistan, especially the issue of human rights and all of that. And, um, and so some of, one of the things that's happened is that taking those concerns into consideration, um, dialogue has taken place between uh, the UAE and uh, um, Afghan women's groups uh, facilitated by UN Women, and I'm sure the UAE will also, and hopefully they should, reach out to other uh, women's forums also around the world, in addition to uh, those in Afghanistan, to hear from them as well, and to also explain uh, about this um, assessment. The assessment has nothing to do necessarily with UNAMA. It's not going to be an assessment of UNAMA's role within Afghanistan. This assessment is about identifying uh, or producing recommendations on how the international community can come onto the same page on issues related to women and girls and good governance and uh, security, counterterrorism, and a whole slew of other issues. Now, the, the resolution was adopted and it does make specific reference to consulting with Afghan women, Afghan women civil society organizations, and Afghan civil society organizations outside and inside of the country. So it does make specific reference to that. Now we need to make sure that the examiner appointed by the Secretary General, um, that, that this becomes a component of the TOR and that the person brought in, if not them necessarily, within that team that's going to be developed in the next couple of weeks quite soon, that there are gender uh, specialists and experts within that team that can make sure that this is comprehensively adopted and then implemented. So as a first step in our advocacy, this is what we're advocating for. So we're looking at potential names for examiners, making sure that the TOR includes um, a lot of focus on, on gender and gender experts being included. Um, so that's going to be first. And then after that, um, we have to look at make sure that the examiner appointed is totally independent and that the process of that, that the report when it comes out, though it's stipulated in the resolution, it's made public. Um, so I've, I've been told that because it's mentioned in the resolution, it's legally binding, so it will be made public. Um, I just, you know, I, I get, I'm a little bit apprehensive, so I just think it's still important for us to push to make that to become uh, uh, public. And um, also, um, we have to make sure that uh, with UN Women, UN Women is involved in this process, as well as other divisions uh, of the United Nations. This assessment will become a part of the peace building uh, unit of, of, of the United Nations. And UNAMA will be facilitating and also participating uh, in uh, a lot of these discussions. So that's there on the assessment part, but we need to watch it very carefully. Uh, because it's, we're, I'm not quite sure what the, what will happen once the recommendations are produced by that assessment, and whether the recommendations produced might bring the international community together on the lowest common denominator. That is our fear. Um, so we should watch it very carefully. And lastly, on the question of the true representatives, or you know, that's a very it's a. I remember during the peace process in Afghanistan, this used to, this logic used to be thrown at the women's movement quite often to discredit the women's movement, because the only movement that was fighting for human rights, not just women's rights, but human rights and democracy, was actually the the women. Whether you like to think that they were Kabul-based, diaspora-led, elite-centric, however you want to label it, and they were in many ways that, they were nevertheless fighting for um, these broader goals. And the two, the four women that were a part of the peace negotiation team, often because such narratives would be circulating, would get called out on the negotiation table uh, by, the, uh, by the Taliban saying, oh, you're not representative of the rest of the people of Afghanistan. And that didn't help our cause. So 
I, I know that in terms of true representative, this is a discussion and I think we should unpack it, but we should also have sort of a definition of what we mean. Inclusivity is actually quite important. That would be one of the key elements of how we should define this, making sure that it's inclusive, ethnically, generationally, ling linguistically, religiously, et cetera. Uh, but at the end of the day, let's be very specific about how we want to identify this. Because for example, we have Ambassador O'Neill with us, who is the WPS ambassador in, in Canada. Now, has Ambassador O'Neill gone and spoken to every single woman in Canada to be able to gather their, their, their demands and their needs and then go take that to the United Nations where she participates? No. So what she does is she speaks to experts and analysts, people who have 10 to 15, 20 years, 30 years more than that in a particular sector, because the idea is that those individuals would have the knowledge, the expertise, um, and as well as policymakers who would have the constituencies as well. So I know that these concepts are very problematic in the context of Afghanistan. Uh, but I think uh, in, in what you've mentioned, we should pay attention to this, but at the same time, let's not use it to further uh, divide uh, uh, a movement that is already facing quite a lot of difficulties and challenges, but rather less push for making sure that this movement is inclusive to the best of uh, our abilities. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria and John. I think I, I, think I couldn't have um, wrapped it up better. I think we will leave it at that. And I uh, want to sincerely thank each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time, um, which is the most precious um, um, commodity of, of, of what we have today. And to the audience, whoever is left, uh, we still have uh, quite a few that are, that are listening. I thank you very much, the CFFP for, um, and I say this not as the CFFP um, advisor now, but as an Afghan woman, um, that the only institution that allowed a committee or and, and truly went in, in in every corner to make sure that it is Afghan owned and from various parts from within Afghanistan and tirelessly day and night worked with me for the past year with these wonderful ladies incredible seven women from all over the world has been CFFP in Germany and nobody else did that. And I am truly thankful for that, um, that, that we have had this. And I wrap it up with that and saying that um, it has been a joy moderating this and I hope to be able to be doing much more. And if Sarajan, you don't have, do you have anything more to add? And maybe I'll give you the mic so that you can wrap it up. And that is it for me. Thank you so much. Also, thank you so, so much. Um, I wish this would have gone longer for hours. I think uh, most of us feel this right now, um, but I think it only shows that there must be so much more webinars, so much more panel talks with Afghan women, um, and that this platform is just, from my side, it's just the beginning, and I hope um, everyone sees that right now, that we need to um, position Afghan women in the center and give them the platform. Um, I want to also thank you from CFP side. Um, we really love to work with you all um, and connect with you all. And um, if you want to um, have an idea what we are doing in general, but also in Afghanistan, please uh, follow our work um, or subscribe to our newsletter. I don't want to make so much advertisement right now, but uh, you will be updated about our work there. So thank you so much, um, everyone. Thank you, Ambassador O'Neill, uh, for your time and staying so long. And um, thank you all for attending.